Everyone, welcome back to another best of for the month of May 2024 of the Innovators Mindset podcast. What a blessing to have you here today to share some insights, to share some incredible guests I've had for the last month. And not only have I had some really amazing guests, but I've shared some solo podcasts. I, I really like kind of just taking some time to share thoughts and long form through this podcast, having a conversation kind of with myself that hopefully someone can else can benefit from. Because I'm, I'm always going through a lot of change. I'm always trying to push myself to become better. And it's one of the things I wanted to kind of open with for this month. I always like to have a little message, a little idea or story. And over the past few years, I've really been focused on my health. Um, it is something that I know has led to me doing better personally and professionally, just kind of making sure that I make some time to take care of my health. But I've also have been dealing with some uh, pretty severe running injuries that I can't barely walk sometimes and I, I'm really struggling. And I always kind of seem to get to this point where I'm pushing myself and then there is this point where I, I typically get injured and then I get better and then I fix it and then I actually get to the point and hurt myself again. And I kind of go through the same process over and over again. So what I've been trying to do is train in a different way. I still have the same goals for my health. I still have some running goals I want to achieve, but it's kind of like I just keep going through the same pattern. It's like this long form of Groundhog Day where I'm just repeating. I'm getting to a certain point, getting hurt, repeat, getting a certain point, getting hurt. And I've totally kind of changed my training and it's it's been helping me so far. I don't want to jinx it by saying that because I'm going to get hurt tomorrow on my run. Who knows? The reason I want to share this, and I think it's really important, is sometimes we are so committed to a goal that we continuously do the same thing over and over again, even when it doesn't serve us in pursuit of that goal. And what we have to sometimes do is change our direction. And it's not to ignore the goal, but understanding that the pathway that we have to what we're trying to achieve is not working the way that we want. It's kind of like you're heading towards a destination, but there's a dead end. And so then you go all the way back and then you take the same route and there's still a dead end. So what you got to kind of do is actually change the route, change the route to where you're trying to achieve. And I think people are reluctant. I know I am to change that route because sometimes it feels like you're quitting. But in reality, when you continuously do the same thing and end up actually faltering through that process, it's not about resiliency as much as it is about stubbornness and I feel like that's kind of what I'm doing I'm just kind of like I'll just push through but there's a pattern that's happening I keep getting injured so I decided to try something else decided to um, you know try some different running techniques to try some different cross training techniques that are very different from what I was doing before and I think that's really helping me so if you think about this not only personally but professionally are you actually trying to achieve some goals in your life and doing the exact same things, but then not reaching your goals? So don't get rid of the goals, but think differently about how you choose that path. Are you hitting that dead end and then just going reverse and then taking the same path? Or are you actually alternating the route? Just something I want you to think about um, to kind of start off the podcast. I, I hope you have um, a wonderful month ahead, but if you didn't get something from me, I promise you, you'll get something from my wonderful guests this month. Welcome back to another highlight video for the Innovators Mindset Podcast. One of the things that I've been watching and saw it's really fascinating is that your school district shifted and, and, and you told me this before, it's piloting right now for a few years to a four day work week. And mm -hmm. I actually, I knew about this. I by the way, and I asked you to write, I sent you some questions you wrote on my blog, and then I got all these comments about how awesome you are. So good for oh, you. Oh, that's so nice. Right? Which is always nice. Like, you know, um, I when I see people on social media and they like say, oh, I'm moving on from my job, and all the people congratulating them don't work in their district, but nobody in their district congratulates them. I'm like, oh, that's not. Because <laughs> I look, I look at that stuff, right? And so, um, I saw, you know, people from your district just saying how wonderful a leader you are, which is really, really nice. And, you know, and I, I'm sure I, I don't get any, like, this is how I am on TikTok, but I'm totally different, you know, yeah. other than me being, you know, starstruck when I saw you, uh, <laughs> you know, a little celebrity sighting. Um, 
tell us about the the shift to the four day work week. Like, why did you do it, and like, what are you seeing so far with this? Because I know a lot of people are are interested because in you know it's not it's not like you just like, hey, everyone, <laughs> guess what? You got Fridays off. It's not that yeah. easy, right? So just talk about that. So during the pandemic, when we had the you know roomies and zoomies, you know, <laughs> teachers kind of doing both things. Um, we I've never heard that. Why well, oh, roomies and zoomies? Isn't mm-hmm. that like dog treats? Like roomies <laughs> yeah, and zoomies? Yeah. Isn't that a zoomie like a dog treat or something? Yeah, like a dog toothbrush or something. Okay, all right. All Maybe right. you could get a sponsorship. <laughs> so um so it was uh we had that and we came back. I mean, teachers were just I mean, this was a totally you know unnerving experience, and I don't want to like drag anyone back to that time, but So we thought like, what can we do to make things better to give people time for planning? And we tried to separate and have virtual teachers and in-person teachers, but some were doing both. And Mm -hmm. so we, um, we went to our community and said, would you be willing to let us release a half day early on Fridays to give our teachers more time to plan for the next week? And the community said, yes, absolutely. And so we did that you know, half day, mm-hmm. half day, um, is we came out and just started seeing like the great resignation and people leaving and then getting to a point where in Texas, you know, almost 30% of, you know, new hires, not, not certified. And we know that, you know, the over half the teachers and leave within their first five years of the profession. So we, we have a system that isn't, isn't working and trying to get to like, why is that, um, Anyway, so we started talking with our staff about what we could do to attract and retain teachers, because we have historically, our communities had very high teacher turnover and um, high teacher turnover means worse outcomes for kids because you can't, you can't move the needle. You can't get traction about things you want to be doing unless you have a team that comes and build sustainability, right? So um, one of the ideas that we kept coming back around to is, you know, we're limited on what we can do with pay. That's set by the legislature. So without some kind of, you know, funding increase from the state, that's not on the table. Um, And so one thing we can work with is time, because in Texas, you have to have 75,600 minutes, but there's no... um, no guidance on how those minutes are structured. And so we started kind of with the idea of what would it be if we went to a four day instructional week, maybe our days are a little bit longer, but then that Friday, um, which is the day we chose to, to be our off day is really truly off. And, um, we started surveying our community. We had a, a team from of people from all over our district, um, special education, fine arts, athletics. I mean, it is Texas, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, so all of the uh, academic leadership really thinking through um, what could this look like and what would it, it mean for us with the sole goal to recruit and retain teachers, knowing that we can't move the needle for kids until we we do that. So Anyway, that was our, the why. And so this was our first year. We took about 18 months to really think through, roll out, survey, build understanding about it with our community and board. And then um, this was our first year to to roll it out. And so it's been really exciting. Um, And I'm exciting as we're starting the hiring season for next year, about what it looks like our retention is. Um, we're seeing gains in our academics, decrease in our discipline data, increased attendance. Um, so, mm. so right now, and we're going to be tracking those things. This is a pilot our board committed to for three years and, um, to see what the outcomes look like over those three years. And then, um, but right now, if everything keeps trending, like it is, I think we'll be continuing and, it's given people like work-life balance, autonomy over their schedule. We've got a lot of people up here on Fridays, but it's like, 
I'm going up at 10 with no makeup on and my hair in a ball cap and taking care of what I need to do. So then I still have the rest of the weekend with my family. Right. Yeah. Mm. You know, so there's uh, something I shared years ago. It's risk is moving from a comfortable average in pursuit of an unknown better. Mm. And I guarantee that I'm sure you heard this. And I know other people will hear this as well. This won't work or this, you know, this wouldn't work if you do this. Well, what we're currently doing is not working. Yeah. So maybe we need to do something else, right? And yeah, it might not work, but we also, we got some good data right now. What we're doing is not working. And I think a lot of times we will just stick with that, even though we, cause we're so scared of the unknown. I've seen this at conferences I speak at. People are like, hey, we want to move to the future. We want to do this. And then I'll challenge them. I'm like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> but it's like, well, you just told everybody. So like, and they got to see you doing it first. So I like right. you see this, but one of the things that, you know, I was really captivated by and, and really talk about that community uh, excellence there, there is a, there is a amazing relationship and community that's been built already there. And so like, Correct. why is that, you know, why is that relationship piece? Why is that community piece so important to the work that you're doing right now? Because I, I think sometimes people get lost in all the visioning, all the academics, but if you don't have people and you don't have the support, if you don't have trust, you never get that place anyway. So why is that so important to what you do in Legion Field? Hey, I just think it's important for parents to trust us as far as, mm -hmm. hey, we have their pride and joys here yep. every day in our facilities. And so with that being said, to me, it's super important that we have these relationships. Like it cannot just be the school constantly mm -hmm. calling the parent being like, oh, little Johnny, little Susie, they're in trouble. It can't always be about the negative. It has to also be about the positive. And so our campuses, they have to be inviting. They have to be yeah. welcoming. Because like I said, this is all we have. And so out here, I have to make sure that my parents know, hey, when you drop your kid off, they have the very best teacher. They have the teacher who is qualified, certified to teach that content area. There is not just a body in that class. They're right. also not just here dibbling and dabbling for eight hours a day. Like they are actually being taught something meaningful because, you know, curriculum is important, whether we, we want to admit that or not. Some people don't think that it is, but I, I don't know. And it also doesn't just need to be a, hey, you come and sit and you get. Okay, I need, I need a little more hands on. I need this to also be a, a place of learning where students feel like their voice is also important oh. and that they also contribute to the educational setting. And so just for me, just thinking about community is family, family is school. So it all just aligns for me here in Elysian Fields ISD. You know, the, the like growing up in a small town, you know, okay. like, first of all, I... I have this affinity to small towns in the sense that I grew up in one and I felt that I didn't have the same amount of opportunity that someone in the city had. And it, honestly, that was true. That was actually true. true. And it, it still might be true in some sense today, but not as true as it was. was. So e even, even in your community, I don't know if there's any other schools, private schools, you know, whatever. So there's none of that. But no. there's always a virtual option. There's always something else that kids can do. There is, and like, homeschooling, so, yeah. So that, that's actually something that, you know, people have to always be cognizant of. Like, would people, do pick, people pick you by default or by choice? All right, so this is kind of putting me on the spot. Because uh, okay. I know that you were sending out this out, not only to everyone that listens to this, but to your own district. So I'm coming there to speak to your staff. If that's a successful opening day, um, what does that look like from me? Like, how can I best serve your community? You know, I think we always need to focus on challenging the status quo. I really think um, we get entrenched in our patterns of thinking. I think we default to what we're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. But I think we as colleagues, as school sites, as individuals, should always be asking ourselves questions. And the questions we should ask is, is this the best way to make the connections so that our kids can own that learning? So I, I, I find that that is such a healthy conversation for us mm -hmm. to just say that just because we've done it that way doesn't mean it's the best way to do it. And now let's spend some time thinking through our assumptions, our traditions, and challenge some of that 
to engage kids in different ways than we have. Um, so I, I hope coming out of that, that teachers are inspired to have those conversations and engage in the work of um, asking, is there a better way that we can make those connections? Is Are there assumptions that the, you know, prime example, is the best way to teach, to spend six weeks teaching every lesson, you know, I do, we do, you do. And then at the end, we give them a test, mm -hmm. which is really at the core is an assessment of how well we did our job. But the focus we give is, oh, we're going to show you how poorly you did your job and ask the question, is this the best way to right. engage our kids? So I, and Ethan, initially at this point, um, that is definitely uh, important. And I, I think um, the start of a year is an opportunity for us to re-engage uh, re in the heart of why we do this job, right. because it can beat you down and you can start worrying more about how many years I have till retirement and what do I have to do to get there, which right. is just a recipe for disaster, right? It's that, it's that marathon focus on the, you know, the, the pain. And instead of thinking, you know, what a, what a unique opportunity we have to do this job that will last far beyond us and in ways that we never could have anticipated for, for the next generation. What's some of the challenges that you've had kind of being in that role without, you know, and admit and how maybe what are some of the ways that you've actually kind of, and you kind of talk about this a little bit in the book, like what are some of the ways that you kind of circumvent that to, even though you don't have a formal assistant principal, how do you tap into leadership in your school? Um, just that I have to tap into the leaders, the silent leaders, the loud leaders, um, the ones that, you know, can generate a crowd, you know, I, I, what you miss, um, and what I've missed is there's no thought partner in mm -hmm. the work and in the seat that understands the role. Like there's no other administrator that's in the building with me that like we can think and unpack it through. Yeah. Um, but what I've done over the years is built up a team around me of what I need and it took a while to get that though because I also am very stubborn and independent and um you know my team loves to remind me sometimes of that but you know you need those people <laughs> right. you right. know you need those people yeah. there like, you don't have to do all of the things by yourself and and I'm like yes I do because I'm the principal and I'm like right. but we're here to help you hmm. um so what I've done um, is found the people that um, fill the void that I have in like my leadership tool belt. So, and I make them, they are the, the, the COO of whatever that is. So for example, I have a math lead and she is the COO of math. I don't try to under, I go to her for the questions. I don't try to figure it out myself. If I have a question about something with the math curriculum or what, our math teachers should be doing or what we should do, I go to her because if I gave her the autonomy to run the math program, then I have to trust that she is, um, yeah. you know, she has all of the information and things that I need. So I've, I've tried to build up people around me that we work as one mm -hmm. and we work as a team because I dream really big. I, I shoot for the moon. Um, I'm very much of a futuristic person and they're like, okay, come on down. Like, this is what we need to do first to get to the mountaintop. Um, and so like, you need those people to kind of push and question okay. and, um, and not yes men. I don't, I don't have a, I, I don't have any yes men on my team, maybe one who's like, okay, it's all right. We can do that. And then, it, but she, she's the one that kind of makes me feel validated right. and seen. And then the rest of them start coming and be in the other pit <laughs> and they're like, nope, this is when it needs to happen. But you just have to trust and right. build a team. You have to. I think that's the only way that if you're ever in this single administrator, single principal role, like you have to build a team and understand that like 
you're the principal, but you don't, you know, you can't run the building by yourself. You know, so it's, it's interesting because you use the term thought partner and a lot of people would use that term, but the way you're talking about it is actually legitimate where some people it's like a thought confirmer. That's what they're actually looking for. Yeah. They're just looking for <laughs> someone to say, I'm going to say this thing. Just tell me I'm right. Uh -huh. and, yeah. and then I'll feel good. Um, I was very influenced when I became an assistant principal by the, the person who was my principal. And I don't know if you read about this, but uh, I actually got in a fight in the interview with the person who was, uh, who was hiring me, who like I got in a fight and I was like, what is going on here? And him and I were just going at each other. And then he hired me and he said, the reason I hired you is you're the only one who pushed back. And I needed, I need someone who challenged me and here's at the end of the day. And I think this is a really important thing. He said to me, when, when we go out there, like you can push back all you want, but I actually have to make, always have to make the final decision because like, it's going to be on me. Right. So you're not getting in trouble. If something goes wrong, I am. So I have to go with kind of, you know, what I feel you got to back me up then. And so like, whether we disagree or not, like do that before, don't do it after and don't do it during.